Blessings Facebook. Blessings, blessings, blessings. This is Pastor Edward here with the Refining Fire. Glory be to the Lord. Hallelujah. This is the Refining Fire, day 28. We're in 30 days of shedding. Hallelujah. God has been so good. Bear with me just a moment as I do my normal sharing. And then we'll be ready to go. And my choir wants to participate. You want to participate, son? Hallelujah. Hey, blessings. Just doing a little bit of sharing here and then we'll be ready to go. Hallelujah. See if I can do some quick share. Hallelujah. 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 Be ready to go in just a moment. All righty. Share it to Messenger. As soon as we get this shared to Messenger, we'll be ready to go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All righty. I just need to send it to this group. There we go. All righty. It's shared. Hallelujah. All righty. Turn that off and our music will play perfectly. Hallelujah. Blessings, blessings, blessings. I see Brother Shadell on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are ready to go with what the Lord has brought forth today. We are on day 28 of 30 Days of Shedding in the Reviving Fire. And God continues to equip us and develop us and place us in a position of success. Uh, God has placed us taking us through discernment, elevating discernment, uh, and with the elevation of discernment, because discernment should be in everything that we do, um, he is calling us to be effective. He's calling us to be effective. As we elevate, uh, he's calling us into a position of elevation. Uh, bless you, Sister Sahara. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Today is going to be a mighty lesson. Uh, this is going to be primarily teaching, giving a tool to be able to clearly and effectively def uh, rightly divide the word uh, so that as you go through and you're studying, as your elevation in God, as you're getting the re revelation, you'll be able to really see the clarity in what God is bringing forth. I'm so thankful for this lesson. We will have some revelation uh, that God is bringing forth. It may pop in through the teaching, uh, but primarily it's going to be direct teaching of a skill set. And then we will move into the revelation portion at the end uh, as God leads. Again, we are in the 30 days of uh, shedding. The refiner's fire. We went through 27 days of prayer. Now we're getting ready to close out 30 days of shedding, moving into a 10 day um, testing period. God is moving and doing so much. He's doing the miraculous. I've seen so many people uh, demonstrate uh, in our background group uh, an elevation. There's been deliverance. Uh, there's been shedding. God is working. God is moving. God is doing it. Anything that you do in God, there should be fruit born. And we are seeing fruit born. Uh, there is such greatness that's occurring and I am thankful for what he's doing. Again, tonight's lesson is going to be strongly on teaching. It is going to be teaching. Hallelujah. I'm glad you got your notebook because this is going to be a night for the notebook. Every night's a night for the notebook, but especially today. Uh, God is going to give us a, a release, a tool that many people use in the scholarship side of it. But when we couple that with uh, our anointing and our relationship with God, it just elevates it all the more and gives us the strength uh, and, and the expertise as well as uh, to increase our effectiveness so that when we hit the bullseye, when we uh, throw that one stone, it will hit the bullseye. It will take the giant down and it will do even more. The subject for today, the subject for today is equipping. Uh, why is rightly dividing the word effective? 
And the very last part is going to give you the fullness of it. There's many reasons why, uh, but this one reason is going to hit your spirit and be like, yes, <laughs> it did mine. So uh, I'm sure it's going to hit yours as well. We will start with the base scripture, go into prayer, and then we will go right into the teaching. The base scripture for the refining fire, the refiner's fire is Malachi 2 through 3 with the promise of 4. Um, um, verse 2 says, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like soap and uh, gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then, this is the promise, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, the offering of the entirety of the chosen because of these Levites, uh, because of these folks who really just want the inheritance of God, that God speaks to them, that God talks to them, that God uh, 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 understands them, that they walk like friends would, that God is able to have a conversation that will release his glory, a conversation that will uh, show them the way in clarity bless you bless you show them the way fully and he says if indeed these folks do this part um the entirety of the the offerings that will the the that will be given to me will be pleasing he says then the offering of judah and jerusalem will be pleasing to the lord as in the days of old and as in former years that is the refining fire god is taking us through a purification process to bring us closer to him and the only way to clearly be closer to him is to walk with uh in uh to walk more pure to get the Im impurities out of us uh so that the things that we offer at the altar the things that we give them our war worship our offering our tithes with the things that we present to the lord as sacrifices as living sacrifices uh they are pleasing unto the lord hallelujah so that's where we are with the refining fire. So what part of it is God talking about today in refining us? Uh, it is our thinking. It's our way of study. It's our way of approach to his word, which all falls in line with rightly dividing uh, the word, rightly dividing the word. Let's go into prayer in the mighty matchless name of Jesus. Lord, we honor you, we love you, we extol you, we lift your name up on high for you and you alone are worthy. Lord, we love you. We, we glorify you. Thank you for being in our lives. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you for no matter how we were, you still saw worth in us. Thank you for being such an honorable God. Thank you for being a God of integrity. Thank you for your character uh, that when we needed to be chastised, you chastised us. When we needed to be rebuked and corrected, you did it. You did not waver because you loved us so, so that we would be in alignment with you. Oh Lord, you loved us so much that you came down on this earth, walked it despite the uh, potential issues that you would face. You faced them for us so that we had a path forward. You've shown us through your walk how we should walk, how we should talk, how we should do things, how we should bear our cross, how we should uh, fight for you and fight for freedom, how we we should go forth and elevate in you and elevate and elevate and elevate. We thank you. We thank you for the promises. We thank you for the blessings. Despite how 2020 has been, despite how 1999, I remember people in 2016 thinking that it was a horrible year for them. Oh, every year is a horrible year, but something about this 2020 has been greater than all. But guess what? You've never left our side. You you never left us hanging. You continue to be right there giving us encouragement and direction. We thank you for that. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for walking in love. We thank you for 
for being love, 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 love. And if anything in us is not like you, Lord, uh, release it from us, cleanse us, purify us, uh, uh, make us white as snow, allow us to show you a cleanse self. Uh, show us the way. Continue to guide us. Uh, Lord, forgive us for our sins of omission and sins of commission. Forgive us for those sins that we did and we knew and knowingly did. Forgive us for those sins that we didn't necessarily know we were doing. Give us, uh, Forgive us for those sins that we didn't even place at your table. We tried to hide it from you. Uh, you see all, so you knew it was there. Lord, we're placing that on at the altar. We're placing that at your feet so that you can do as you need. We believe that the windows of heaven uh, will open up over our life. They're already open. Uh, we are feeling your glory shine down on us. Thank you for opening the windows of heaven over our lives. Lord, we know uh, that your promises will come true, that you will give us a blessing poured out in overflow. Your blessings poured out, that overflow is exponential. Uh, but mostly, Lord, we thank you for the walk with you. We thank you for being able to talk with you. We thank you uh, for being able to feel your presence. And we thank you for uh, all the times that we've had that we could look back and rely on you. We thank you for it. glory, glory, glory. In your mighty name, Jesus, as we go forth and teach this lesson, the lesson that you want us to teach, the equipping that you want us to do, Lord, as we go forth, as we go forth in your word and you reveal all that you want us to know tonight, uh, decrease me and let your word go forth. In your mighty matchless name, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 In our background group, we kind of talked a little bit about this uh, lesson. We'll primarily be in 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. We're going to jump around and do a little bit of aerobics, but we're primarily going to be in 1 Corinthians 8. I am going to start today in 2 Timothy uh, 2 through 5. Uh, many times I have spoken and I have mentioned about the three levels that God releases words in, or uh, he releases a, uh, his glory and the, the three different ways that he really talks to us on a normal basis in regards to um, scripture as well as leaving, leading our lives. The words that he's releasing immediately, uh, we talked about the word itself, uh, we've talked about revelation, and we've talked about rhema. Uh, revel uh, the word itself. Hallelujah. Stop, boy. Buddy. Buddy. All right, here we go. He's kicking my cord, and I need my cord. Uh, actually, before I go into that portion, I got to tell a little bit of story. Because it was sitting on me earlier, and I'm, it's just so funny. Uh, all my life, I've been... Um, I always ask my daughter, uh, I, I don't know why, I ask her, you know, I'm, I tell her I'm old, I'm old, I'm old, I'm old. And she looked at me the other day, well, she's been telling me all year long and, you know, she's 19 now. She's been saying, hey, you're not old, you're not old even this year. But last week when we were, uh, I was giving her a backpack because she wanted a backpack. She was so excited for it. And then later on, she got on a duo so she can see uh, E4, Edward, and she got on the duo, and while she was on the duo, she looked at me and she said, Dad, what's that in your beard? And I was like, y you're looking at my beard. I I'm afraid where this conversation is about to go. And, and she looked at it and she said, Dad, you're getting old. I was like, oh, see, here we go. So I, that was just a side note that was, I just really wanted to bring up. Bless you, Mother Cam. Bless you, Mother Cam. Hallelujah. Oh, uh, it had nothing to do with the lesson. It was just something that was, I just had to release because I it hit me right before I got on here. I started thinking about it. It's called me old. All right, I'll take that. Uh, I'll take that. So uh, we're going to start with uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 15. But again, we were talking about the word, the rhema. I mean, the word, the revelation and the rhema. The word itself is actually the scripture, the actual word, the word that we read. Then we have the revelation so we can get stuff from the word. But then the revelation is that elevated component that only God can give. 
And God gives us that elevation, uh, elevated component uh, through our conversations with him, through the urging of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, he also uh, gives that through our daily walk and we start seeing visions and dreams and he'll start talking to us that way and give us some insight. But then even in those same components, it goes to the next level, the rhema. The rhema is simply the right now word. What God is saying right now for this time, for this moment, exactly as it pertains to, oh, uh, it could be on a national, it could be on a global stage, it can be on, a, you know, just all over. It can be everywhere. Um, but a lot of times we hear and we connect with the rhema word because it's direct direction to what he's calling us to do. Uh, we might have asked him a question and he's giving us the direct answer on what to do next or what something meant. Um, that rhema, that right now word, what God is talking about right in this moment, what he's answering, uh, what he's projecting, what he is releasing uh, right at the moment. And when we look at the word itself, uh, we have to understand that everything comes back to the word and the spirit. It says test all things. And it doesn't say test some things. It says test all things and hold fast to that which is good and true. How do you do that? The word and the spirit, or the first thing, the word and the spirit, they shall agree. Um, but how do you know if the word is agreeing with the spirit? First thing, you've got to study. you got to be in the word and you have to be studying it. And not only just studying it for the sake of studying, God will reveal an understanding about the word, but he wants us to elevate and to be able to dig into the word and to be able to connect with his word, not just by a repetitive uh, uh, amount of study, but also by being able to use tools uh, that he gives us that he authorizes to do it. When I was in school, uh, one of the components that was taught to me was exegesis. Exegesis is simply a critical look at the word. And within exegesis, there is tons, there are tons of ways to go about it, tons of tools. I'm going to talk about a three-part simple way, um, but it's still very robust. But even with what we can teach today, it still goes on. There's rhetorical criticism. Uh, there's literary criticism. There, I mean, there's so much um, within exegesis, but for the purposes of the elevation and to, in essence, take one step up or even a two or three steps up, uh, the, the exegesis components God is releasing today will help there because as we, uh, learn how to navigate the word and understand what the word is saying, we will be able, um, to unleash more of the fullness of the revelation, more of the fullness of the rhema, because th those two components always go back to the word. Because even God says, test me in, in Malachi 3 and 10. He says, test me and see if I don't open the windows of heaven over your life and pour out blessings uh, in overflow. He says, test me. So God means what he says. He is a God of integrity. He says, test me. So test all. All things is not devoid of testing God. And we're not talking about testing him as into and in testing his patience uh, and, and so on and so forth. Or like these folks with COVID-19, they were testing him uh, that he would save them just like Jesus was in the wilderness. He said, I'm not going to test God. He's not talking about that. He's saying, uh, find, look at the word that I spoke and uh, uh, measure it against the word and the spirit. Those things should agree. If you just do what I ask, um, you will find that this happens. In that case, he was also saying, it just let, I dare you to do it and you'll see. So all this testing component, uh, it, it requires us to, uh, to have an understanding of the word. And so when we look at the revelation and the rhema, what we find is too many people have limited um, the fullness of understanding that God is desiring that we give out. Faith without works is dead. Um, if you look through the Bible, love, he's not talking about e emotions. He's actually talking about an action. Uh, a decision is an action, a choice. 
action. A choice is an action. How you walk is an action. So God is saying that there's nothing that I'm calling you to uh, that doesn't require some sort of action from some place. And so if we want an elevation in the revelation that God gives us, if we want an elevation in the hearing that God wants to release to us, we must do something uh, to activate it. I'm not saying that God won't release things just to release it. He, he'll do that. We're not going to put God in the box, but too many people have. And that's why they haven't heard clearly or even heard the fullness. We also have to understand in the scripture in Amos uh, that he, he does nothing uh, without giving it to his prophets or uh, no judgment without giving his it to his prophets first. But then he only gives it out in parts. So this pro this prophet will get it. That prophet will get a piece. That prophet will get a piece. And the body working together will get the fullness of it. But how much better would it be if we can hear the fullness of the piece that he gives us? And that begins with our, our, our skill sets in understanding the word of God. And that's why uh, Paul was saying that it's important to rightly divide the word. And so that's what it says in 2 Timothy 2 and 15. It says, uh, be diligent to present yourself approved uh, to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth or right Fully divide, abiding the word of truth. Um, when it says, uh, approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. A workman, uh, a workman means that there is an action. A workman means that there is a component of action. There, there has to be some work. Remember, we were just talking about that. Uh, we have to be able, just like I said, faith without works is dead. If we want increased revelation, there is a component that we have to walk out. If we want the blessings and overflow, if we want um, uh, um, the windows of heaven, to uh, bless you, Prophet Tiffany. If we want the blessings of the windows of heaven to open up, it says bring the tithes and the offering, all of them into the storehouse. We have to move in action. A workman who does not need to be ashamed. If we accurately uh, uh, handle the word of truth, if we uh, rightly divide the word of truth, what we will find is that when we speak the word of God, we will not be ashamed. When we speak the word, we can speak it in, current, uh, in confidence. When we speak the word of God, uh, we will be able to um, speak it in strength and confidence. And people can't move us because we know what the word says. See, many people want to try to rightly divide the word, but they're doing it in the wrong spirit. When they do it in the wrong spirit, you often see that uh, played out as I'm going to beat you over the head. That's not love. That's not godly. That's not righteous. All these uh, people with a form of godliness, they, they don't have a problem with being divisive. They don't have a problem with creating strife. And a lot of times they use the word of God to create strife. God is not calling us to create strife. He's calling us to stand firm on his word and to be confident in it so where we are unmovable. But the purpose is to, we all know this, Everything we do on this earth, every assignment that God gives, every choice that we make should be in alignment with his will. And his will is alignment with his purpose. And his purpose is to move the kingdom of God forward. So we're teaching a tool tonight to actually get us to that component. And that tool is exegesis. Um, uh, when I was studying in school at Rochester College, uh, what I spent some years, actually a couple years, uh, about a couple years, uh, um, studying on exegesis. It was a strong point. Exegesis from a scholarly standpoint is so important. If we look at preachers, uh, and especially those who are true students of the word, you can bring up the term exegesis to them. They know exactly what it is. You probably heard somebody talking about, oh, uh, women can't be preachers. Uh, and they take it over to Timothy. And then they sit there and say, um, you hear someone who actually hears from God says, you're, you're, you're not rightly dividing the word. You need to exegize the text. You need to do some exegesis on the text because that situation, since I, hey, buddy, since I, you want to come down here and play? Uh, here, here. I got this for you. You want that? You want that? You know? You want to be up here? He wants to stay up here with daddy. 
All right, you can stay up here. Tell everybody hi. Hi. Since I touched on that situation, um, the situation that Paul was dealing with, and we find out through the whole scripture that a lot of issues, a lot of things that Paul was speaking on was because there were situations in that church, in that local gathering of people. And so he had to handle it on a church by church basis. And in that case, there were issues happening um, where he had to put a some order in place uh, because of everything that was going on. That was a local issue. Uh, and God is demonstrating through that scripture. There is a spiritual component on um, the spiritual component or the spirit of the thing is that there needs to be some kind of order when things are out of place but women are allowed to preach women can be apostles women can be so we got to stop getting we got to let that demonic spirit that causes the church to have lack of power um to move out the way galatians says in the body of christ there's neither male or female jew neither jew nor gentile neither male nor female uh see see god is not a stupid god and I'm only bringing this up. This was not part of the lesson. But I'm only bringing this up because uh, that section was uh, talking about Timothy was placed in my spirit. And so, therefore, I believe there needs to be an explanation and an understanding. Um, when we look at the scripture itself, it says in the body of Christ. Well, we are in the body of Christ. Uh, there is neither male nor female. And so what God is saying that women can preach, women can be apostles, women can be uh, so on and so forth. And we need to respect the authority. We don't serve a stupid or ignorant God. And many people are uh, walking in that demonic, uh, misogynistic spirit uh, will say that women can't. Or I can't be a preacher. Uh, I can't fall under line with a, a woman preacher. Well, well, you're not falling in line with the flesh. When you sit there and you are saying that a woman can't be preaching Preacher, you're not seeing the spirit of the thing. You're, you're seeing the flesh of the thing and you need to elevate and get a little bit higher. So when I sit there and I'm talking to, to people and I'm sitting here letting them know uh, you are out of order when you come up against a woman who has been placed in authority. Because one, you place God in a box. God is greater than any of these things. And when we rightly divide the word, we start understanding that was a local issue that Paul was handling. And we see it throughout the scripture that mo a lot of the situations even with Corinth, the, uh, the church in Corinthians, that God was, uh, or Paul, was handling a local issue. So when we go back and we look at that uh, component about, you know, God not being ignorant, God not being stupid, um, we have to understand that the flesh deceives. Well, you know, why are we going to place the anointing? Why is God going to place on an, uh, an anointing uh, on a component that we have to kill daily? That we have to beat down daily. So we're beating down the anointing over and over and over. Beat, that doesn't make sense. God is not going to place us in a position. So when we beat the flesh down that has the anointing, we will be ending up beating the uh, anointing down too. We don't have that power to beat the anoint, anointing down, nor do we have the authorization. Our God is not stupid. Our God is not, intel, uh, 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 is not um, ignorant. Uh, our God is very much capable. He is ever present. He's omnip omnipotent. He, he's all knowing. He is a God that knows what he's doing. And man likes to put them in a box and the devil has done that through the spirit of religion uh, because it was a tool to keep the people powerless our God is not stupid God is not po uh, powerless he's not going to place uh, an anointing on the flesh uh, and allow this person to say that they're anointed and God actually say they're anointing with it on the flesh the anointing is on the spirit the uh, spirit is not gender it has no gender it is genderless God places it on the spirit and the spirit uh, there we go Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The spirit is genderless. The spirit does not deceive. The spirit is what it is. So God places the anointing on the spirit. Uh, so that's why we can say in the body of Christ, there's neither male nor uh, female, because in the body of Christ, it is actually a spiritual thing. God is not going to place a, 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 an anointing on a component of the body that deceives, on a component of the body that is in conflict with the spirit. It does not make sense. So we got to get that right. So I'm sorry. I had to tear down a false altar. Uh, that's what we needed to hit. God needed us to hit that before we get into the exegesis component. So in the exegesis component, we have to understand that there is a work to do. Uh, we have to be active in study. We have to be active in our word. We have to be active in walking.
And so uh, we just we're gonna skip over to one Corinthians and eight. Hallelujah. And I'm going to ask a specific question. I asked this same question in the background group today, and we studied it all day long. Uh, because in rightly defining the, dividing the word, uh, we have to be able to understand. Remember, um, no word that God gives is, is going to be devoid of how it was presented when it was first presented. Let me, let me go back into that. In the time that Paul spoke the word or in the time that these words were spoken, um, it had a reason and it had a purpose. And so that same purpose is the same purpose today. It did not change the revelation of the word that God spoke back then is based in how it was spoke for today is based in how it was spoken back then. All right. So that's where we are back then. We need to be able to go back then to see what it, the purpose of that word spoken was so that we can understand how it plays a part today. And when we understand how it plays a part today in that revelation as God speaks to us and elevates our thinking and understanding in that word, because revelation only comes from God, write the vision. And when he says write the vision, write the revelation, write, write that uh, divine thing. That's Habakkuk 2 and 2. Write that divine thing that I have given you. Write it down on a tablet so that other people who can see it can run with it. It's that divine component it's from the Holy Spirit that gives the uh, perception, that gives the movement for people to run with it, and that connects spirit to spirit so that the elevation occurs, that the activation occurs. God is saying that we must understand that we uh, have to see how it was clearly back then so we understand the, uh, how it plays a part today, the revelation and the elevation in the word that God has given that only comes from him, uh, and then he can give us how it plays a part right Right now, the rhema, the rhema, the word right now, the active word, the, the, the in the moment word, the right now word. Hallelujah. So exegesis. So we ask this question in 1 Corinthians 8. We're going to go to the very last verse. And it says, Paul is talking to them. He says, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And I asked them to look at first Corinthians eight. I said, is Paul ask telling the church in Corinth to be vegetarians? Is he calling us as Christians to be vegetarians? Well, many, the re one reason I'm bringing that up is because many people will pervert the word for their personal gain. They will per uh, pervert the word for their agenda. We are, cannot afford to pervert the word because that is a demonic component. If we are going against the agenda that God has, that's why we have to understand the word and how it truly plays a part. Uh, many people will take that, especially those who are vegetarians, they will take that scripture and say, well, Paul intended for us to be vegetarians well let me give you the answer to that question uh first first of all no he didn't that was not his intent that is not an argument for him we're tearing down these false altars because we want to really understand what the word is saying he did not intend for uh the uh, as a global as a, a universal message universal means that it there's cultural, there's universal. Uh, cultural is just for that time and that season, so, such as, you know, if my right eye offends me, pluck it out, you know, so on. It's figurative can be one of those components. He didn't mean for us to actually pluck our eye out. It was figurative he was talking about, and, and it was based on that. We don't hear about all these one eye Klingons, so we got to be able to really understand how the word plays a part. Universal means that it covers all bases, and it's from that time to now. It never changes. It's not just cultural. It means exactly what it means, exactly how it is. Uh, but God is saying that I need you to understand the word in all of its nuances, how it plays a part so that you uh, don't fall in the trap of someone perverting the word and you don't accidentally pervert the word. So God wants us to walk in righteousness all the time. 
And so when we look at that scripture, uh, when someone sits and say, well, guess what? Um, you got, uh, Paul was saying we got to be vegetarians and they refer us to that scripture where well, they're completely inaccurate. They need to study the word a little bit more. So with exegesis, there's three components to it. So we must look at it from three points. In, uh, so we got to look at um, the word itself. The second part is um, in, so in the word, in front of the word. And behind the word. So we have in the word. In the word is actually what the word is saying. Not all this extra stuff. Just exactly reading the word. What does the word say? And a tool that I often use is I, I read the scripture. Or I, or, uh, and say if it's just one scripture. I read the scripture before. And I read the scripture after. Let's get a little context in there. Then I look at the chapter. The full chapter. Then I look at this chapter before. And I look at the chapter after. Sometimes I got to do a couple chapters before. And a couple chapters after. Because you got to get context. You got to get an understanding of what's going on around there then you can start to understand what that scripture means then the second part is what's in front of the word it doesn't and these things don't have a particular order but the first thing you want to do is before looking up in a concordance before looking up in a um um uh, Looking at uh, up what uh, what is it uh, commentary before looking up scholarly documents so on and so forth before doing any of that you want to put your thoughts out there first on paper and really analyze it put so it cannot be moved because if God is giving you direction and giving you a word um, you don't want to be accidentally swayed by the thinking of someone else you want God to release what it is for you in the direction he wants you to call because we can look at one scripture and such as that uh, verse 13 and I can do a whole sermon on uh what we're talking about right now, I can do a whole sermon on stumbling. I can do a whole. So what is God conveying and what? How, so we need to understand this word. The second thing is, uh, and again, no order. Um, it is in front of the word. So picture yourself when you have the scripture laying on a, uh, sitting on a table and you're sitting uh, looking at the word. You are in front of the word. So what does that mean in front of the word? What do I need to analyze about me? Well, when you're looking at what's in front of the word, what that is saying is the experiences that you bring to the table, the perception that you bring to the table, um, the, the, it can go on and so, so, you know, go on further. But when we look at it, many of us have an experience that we personally bring to the table when we are reading the word. It can be, uh, uh, you know, a good experience. It could be bad experience. We, you know, some, some of these trigger some things thinkings of experiences that we've gone through. And sometimes our experience can either be a plus to the situation or it can be a distraction from the situation. So we have to analyze how our experiences, how what we bring to the table uh, affect our interpretation and reading of the word. So we have uh, the word itself. Then we have in front of the word. So, so many people don't understand their experiences can um, uh, uh, cause the word itself to be interpreted skewed. So that's why you need to understand the baggage in essence. Because, you know, we talk about baggage all the time. Don't bring, bring baggage here. And don't, we got to understand what we're carrying uh, into the, uh, the while we're trying to rightly divide the word and make sure that we aren't allowing it to influence um, our uh, objective understanding of what the scripture is, is speaking. Um, and then after you've gotten an objective viewpoint, go back and see, uh, add those components, the experiences in, the, uh, you know, because some experiences will elevate the understanding and some may not. So when we look at this, we have, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Again, is Paul asking them to be vegetarians? The answer I said was no. But it's partially yes, too. And as we break this down, we'll understand it. The third part is what's behind the word. What's behind the word? Remember, we were talking about how what it meant back then is how it still means today. The, the, the essence of it back then still means what it means today. So so what's behind the word is what the culture was. 
Uh, because some of these things, if we look at Matthew, he's talking to the Jews. He leaves out some things uh, because it's already well known. Um, in that community amongst the Jewish community so he doesn't have to go into a long diatribe where Luke is talking to government officials and Mark is talking to some Gentiles and so if we look at Luke he goes into a lot more detail because a lot of them don't understand the culture of that time so he has to put the context in for them to read it so it's our job back here to say okay uh, he's talking to Jews so that's part of the, the what's behind the text so that's why uh this component is not spoken to as clear, I mean, as, as prevalent uh, because they already know it. Uh, we have to understand the setup of the location. We have to understand, you know, the the you know the political climate. We have to understand everything that's going on and why it plays a part. If we can understand the political climate, we can better understand um, the dynamics of Moses coming up to Pharaoh. We can understand some of these other why. Um, uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, came to Jesus in private. Um, we, we start understanding the culture behind it. It elevates the fullness of the word. So, so let's dig in and really look at it. Like I said, some of these things um, you can look at first uh, and some in the second. But you want to do what you can first before actually going into looking at commentaries and what other people have written and so on and so forth. Um, throughout all of this, you got to be prayed up. Prayer and a conversation and communication with God uh, because we are looking for a divine understanding. We're not looking for a worldly understanding. We are looking for a divine understanding. God will show us what he wants us to show. We're not walking like, like it says, um, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is also the beginning of um, wisdom. But going back to the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, we are understanding that when he says, lean not on your own understanding, uh, he's talking about, I need you to get into my mindset. All knowledge, yeah, we may be able to get knowledge here and knowledge there, and we're going to talk about a little bit more because this kind of goes into what Paul is saying. Um, but, but not all knowledge is good. Not everything is profitable for us. Just because we know it doesn't mean it, 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 it's what's necessary here. So we got to get God's mind on it. That's why he's saying identify uh, what we're doing. So, so we got to get God's mind on even how he wants us to divide the word so that we're always in alignment and we're we're pulling in only what is necessary from him uh, and not putting even the worldly experience in because that's what a lot of people do they go through reading the scripture and next thing you know it's a worldly conversation well it's because they left God out of it so you got to stay prayed up you got to stay in prayer with God so when we rightly divide the word and we're looking at it from a perspective of oh uh, what's the word is saying and what's in front of the word and what's behind the word then we start getting a perspective. So the first thing I'm going to look at is the scripture itself. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stomach. Though the question that we have, bless you, Sister Carnese, um, the question that we have before us is, is Paul saying that we all should be vegetarians? And second is, is Paul saying that the uh, people of Corinth should be vegetarian. The answer is no to the first and um, yes, to, uh, yes, sort of in the second. Um, so so let's understand this a little bit more. So we got to kind of look at what Paul is saying in regards to the scripture. So what was really going on? So first thing we look at is let's read the scripture. Chapter eight, it says now concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. <laughs> if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. But for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all are all things and we exist for him and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom all things and we exist through him. 
However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the uh, to the idol until now eat food. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it is eat meat uh, because he's he kind of stops at that. So keep that meat component in your mind. Eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who has have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, so in essence, he's basically saying in that, you know, if you got a weaker brother or sister, they see you. They're just learning this thing. They've come out of the world. Uh, they, 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 they live this worldly life. And now you're going to a place where they've actually participated in. If you go into that place, um, will they not think that it's OK? And then now they fall in. And they've gone back to the ways that they were. They've gone back to the 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 uh, sort of like if it's a, a alcoholic, you know, alcoholics after they've come through sobriety, um, they may not want to walk into a um, bar. But if uh, you know, if indeed uh, someone who uh, is strong in Christ and they know that they um, so they don't fall um, strong in Christ. And they don't have any type of issues, but then they go into the bar and they know, you know, the weaker brother or sister knows that. And I say weaker uh, is just to give an idea and understanding um, sees a elder of uh, who has been in the word for quite a while. Go into a bar. They may not even understand why they're going in the bar. They may not understand the full print, but if they just see them. They can get a perception that it's OK. So even if they never even go in the bar themselves to see what's going on, but they could get that perception that it is OK. That's why it says don't even have the appearance of um, improprieties. Um, we must understand that people can see what we're doing. And if indeed they see what we're doing, um, they may say, well, you know, why am I being um, sober? Why am I going through sobriety? Uh, I guess since it's okay for them to go to the bar, I can go to the bar too. Now we've made him stumble. He's back to being alcoholic. He could be dying and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what the essence of what's being said right there. Uh, let's keep going on. For the through, uh, hold on one second here. I hate when these commercials come on. All right, come on. The music was getting good too. <laughs> All righty, here we go. All righty. So, going forward, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, and for and the brother for whose sake Christ died, and so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience. When it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. So that kind of gives a better perspective of what's being talked about there. But again, does that answer the question? It gives a little bit of the answer to the question, but we kind of need to understand it a little bit more. Maybe we need to do some rhetorical criticism. What that is, is um, investigating it from the language type that it's doing. Historical criticism, looking at the culture, that behind the word uh, component. So let's look at the behind the word component. Let's set up some of the background um, and, and then we're going to more of the uh, stronger culture, but the way we can get the back background, again, sometimes you have to read the chapter before and the chapter after, um, but a lot of questions is, uh, is simple. Who is he talking to? Who is he talking to? We got to find that out. Who is Paul talking? Who is talking and who is he talking to? Well, let's be sure that it's Paul talking. We know it's Paul talking, but let's be sure that it was Paul talking. Uh, how do we know this? Okay, it says in the very first chapter, and usually in the first chapters of these epistles or epistles or letters, um, it defines who's who's talking and who is um, who they're talking to. And so in the very first chapter, it says Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of, of God and Sothenes, our brother. So so there's actually two people involved in this writing. It's Paul. And Sophony, he usually has someone else 
in the mist when you start looking at it. Um, it, it kind of gives that authority component. It's not just me that knows what's going on. It, it's multiple people that's going on. So it's Paul who's who, who's writing this in essence. We kind of just solely equate it to him. And he, it says in the next verse, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So he's talking to that body of believers at, in the city of Corinth. So that gives us an understanding. So now um, in that dynamic, we might need to look up the uh, history and the culture of Corinth at that time as well. So we take note of that uh, to those who have been sanctified in Jesus Christ. Uh, he's talking to he's he, he's narrowing it down. I'm talking to the Christians. I'm actually talking to um, some higher level Christians, not just you know, like all of us are reading it, but he's actually sending this letter to the leadership and to these folks in the church who are uh, considered saints uh, by whether it be by their mindset. You'll see why I say that. Or if it's by uh, actual, you know, how they've defined the leadership role with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and ours. And so now. Um, he's talking about them and he's, he, he's setting the stage. He's setting the stage of all that's uh, through there. Bless you, brother Nazareth. Um, so grace to you and peace from our God, father and the Lord Jesus. That's just a salutation, you know, Hey, how greeting and all that stuff. Um, so I thank God, uh, my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which, uh, was given you in Christ Jesus, uh, that in everything you were in which he's kind of exhorting them right now, um, giving them encouragement and recognizing, um, their standing and what they've been doing. Uh, it, it's just a, a it, if you use this t same type of dynamic in your writing, it actually will call, you'll be able to have a conversation or even a writing with other people more effectively, especially if you have to give some hard news. Uh, if you follow the way that Paul wrote his letters, you'll start seeing, Oh wow. Uh, if I, if I present it this way it, and it's a harder lesson that, or, or, or more direct conversation I have to give, uh, more people will be able to, Listen to it more uh, because it puts people in a comfort uh, position. So let me keep going that in everything you were enriched in him and I'll speak. I'm trying to get to the other person because I've read it. I, I know exactly who he's talking to. So he, he wants to we need to understand exactly who Paul is talking to. Uh, so we know who who is talking Paul and we also know his Sothenes there. Um, but also. He's talking to the church, but there's some specific people he's mentioned as well. So I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which is given to you in, Je in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful through whom you were called into faith fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I exhort you, brethren, um, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there will be uh, no division among you. I encourage you. I encourage you uh, to take this piece to heart that there's no disagreement, no di division among you. He's uh, demonstrating that he's addressing issues. Uh, so as we start start looking at this, we're, we're realizing that part of the understanding of the uh, culture that was going on back there was when he wrote this letter uh, to the Corinthians, he was writing this letter in a way uh, to address an issue. That brings more light to him just saying he's not just saying uh, let me write this. He's not directly writing to us in essence. He's writing a letter to people there at that time. And this is what they're going through. And, and what lessons are we supposed to learn from this? And so uh, going forward, for I have been informed concerning you. Remember, I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you. Oh, see, he it goes even further. He's like, I hold up. I'm getting ready to address an issue. So in essence, what we know is he was sent something. Either they came to see him or a letter was sent or multiple letters were sent. So he's addressing an issue that he's already aware of. 
and he's in his apostolic uh, authority, he is laying down some expectations. He's presenting them in a way. So, so it, 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 it's starting to make what we're learning in 1 Corinthians 8 be more robust. All righty, let's keep going. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul. I of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So they are walking in division. And what they are walking in division is they're saying that um, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by this person. This person brought me into Christ. Uh, Bishop so-and-so is the one who brought me in. Uh, Apostle this brought me in. We hear that all the time. So we're starting to get a revelation of understanding like, dang, don't we hear that too? I belong to this church and I belong to, that's my bishop and that's this and that's that. And he's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Or, or let's look at it even more locally. You have, you have multiple leaders in the church. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. You have multiple leaders in the church. And with those multiple leaders, what you find is that there's division within the church and they're saying I was brought in by the assistant pastor. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to follow him and I'm going I'm not going to listen to the senior pastor. I'm going to do this. I'm, that's what's going on in that church. Let's take it even further. You've got a new a church and one person, the old leader died. And now there's a new leader. And they say, well, that's not how Bishop so and so did it. Oh, uh, I, I was brought in by this person. Not uh, he was addressing that issue in many of this component. He, he and immediately he said, he says, has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? <laughs> Hold on. We, we under the same body. We, we under Jesus Christ. Let's let's stop putting it in man's hands and stop saying uh, we're not here for division. Paul was a problem solver. So so so. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, buddy. So Paul, when he was solving these problems, uh, what do you want? Here you go. When he was solving these problems, uh, and we see that in many of his lessons, it starts giving us a greater understanding. So what we know is that Paul um, received a letter. Here we go. Paul received a letter. He received some kind of information, whether it be, be by a letter or it was by them actually coming. Because there's a, a, a component where we can research and we'll find that there was some face-to-face -face interaction with Paul. Um, and, and, and that they probably left that information. This is what's going on in Corinth. Um, but it was by Chloe's people that brought this information to me. So y'all know. And I'm writing to these people. All right. That makes sense. So let's go back to verse 8. Remember I said pay attention to, where'd it go? Hold up, I just closed it. Um, remember I said pay attention to, for I have been informed concerning you. Remember to pay attention to that. So we're going to go back and we're going to start breaking down 1 Corinthians 8. I pray this is blessing you. This is a teaching. We're teaching and equipping. Like I said, this was an equipping lesson. Why is rightly dividing the word effective and we'll find that answer directly at the very end you'll see it in just a moment there's many reasons but this one god want me to draw out so let's go back to 1 corinthians 8 when we break it down and rhetorical quick uh criticism is kind of analyzing the language uh, the rhetoric the way it's spoken and so such and so on and so forth and when we look at um different types of criticism in 1 Corinthians 8, it says, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. Hold up. Now I'm going to address the concern that, that I was brought to my attention that I know you're talking about. We know that we all have knowledge. And, he, and what he's saying is, I know that you sit here saying, I know what I'm doing. I know. He's actually, in essence, in a lot of this, quoting what the other, in essence, letter was. They're, what they're actually saying. So they know specifically what Paul is talking about. Because they sit here running around, I have all this knowledge. I know what I'm doing. I ain't going to fall short. I ain't going to do this. We've heard this all again. And see, see, even in this teaching, there's a lesson that God is bringing out that is revelation. 
That's why God says rightly divide the word because you can start seeing this section of scripture differently. Uh, I know uh, the folks in the background have been studying this. And as they've been studying this, um, it, it's probably bringing a, a new um, view of this, this set of scripture. So he said, so first thing he said, we know that all we all have knowledge. And so he's quoting them and now he's responding. He said, knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. He said, I know you saying this, but hold up. Let me tell you something. All right. We got that. Next one. It says, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought. He's still responding to them. He's responding to that point. He is, he is taking their, their criticism and their justification He's taking those things piece by piece to break it down and to refute it and to give them answers to it. But he's doing it very calculated like. Um, so therefore concerning eating of meat, of uh, things sacrificed to idol. Now let me address your other concern. We know that there is. And that's it. So now he's quoting, even though it doesn't have quotes, because uh, there wasn't that thing of our type of quotation to set things apart like it is, like we have it today. So so you kind of have to understand their language back then and understand how it plays a part. So he's saying, uh, therefore, concerning eating of things sacrificed, to OK, so we're going to we're going to switch topics for a second. And he says, we know that. And here's where he's quoting. He's quoting them saying there is no such thing as an idol in the world. So he's saying, we know this. You all said there's no such thing as an idol, so it's okay to walk. We know this. We know this. Gotcha. We know this. But he's also being very sarcastic with him in the same way. Because his response demonstrates the sarcasm in which he's talking about. That's why we have to understand these different type of uh, rhetorical components so we can uh, break the word down in such a way that we get an understanding of it. So he says, um, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. We know we know this. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven and earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, he's saying, let me answer. This is what I'm saying. Yet for us, that there is but one God. There's still but one God. Well, we know these gods are imaginary. Well, we know this and we, 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 we get it. You know, those are made up in their minds. But, you know, for, for them, it's kind of real. For them, it is uh, because they're just coming out. They don't have that knowledge that you have. And, and you kind of, in essence, he goes about, he said, you got to think about other people. All right, let's keep going. It says, the father from whom are all things and we exist for him. We exist for him. Remember, we talked about the purpose. We exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things that we exist through him. All right, I'm breaking this down. I'm giving you some uh, foundation. However, not all men have this knowledge. However, you may have it. We know this. I know this. You and I, I got you. I got you. But let's let's bring your pride and ego down a little bit. Uh, not everybody got what you got. Let's pl he's playing to he's actually playing to a lot of people's ego there. He's playing to the pride there. Um, and he, he's bringing them down. He was very wise in his conversation. He, he, you know, it wasn't do this because I told you to do it. He's like, OK, let's play with your logic. But 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 let's let's think a little bit bigger. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now. But some have been accustomed to. To the idol. Some have been worshiping ball. Some have been worshiping money. Some have been worshiping TV. Some have been worshiping food. Some have been worshiping sex. Some have been worshiping um, uh, ungodly relations. Uh, some have been worshiping heroin. Some have been worshiping weed. Some have been uh, worshiping alcohol. Some have been worshiping homosexuality. Some, I can keep going. Y'all get my point. He said, not everybody has your knowledge. But some have been living a life in there. We talked about alcohol and they lived a life in the bar. So when they, let me keep going. 
and their conscience being weak is defiled. And their conscience has not developed where yours is yet. They're still working through some things. Their conscience right now is defiled. It hasn't gotten to your level yet. But food will not commend us to God. So, but you know, I, you know, y'all want to go and eat food. Y'all want to go to these places. See, we still, I still haven't pulled out any commentary. I'm actually working in the revelation that God is dropping me as I speak. I'm also working in the understanding of the word. I'm working in the breakdown of the word to get where we're going. I, we still haven't added in some of these other cultural components because that's going to blow your mind in just a moment. Um, and he said, but but it should have already elevated your understanding of what Paul is talking about. But we still ain't got to the fullness of it. Why I say partially yes, but mainly no. He's not telling people to um, be vegetarians, but kind of yes. <laughs> so so it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna uh, come to uh, come together in just a moment. He said, but food will not uh, commend us to God. Food ain't gonna get us to God. It ain't gonna take us away. We are neither the worse if we do eat or neither the better. So we know, you know, because these things ain't real anyways. But I'm thinking bigger. I'm thinking about our brothers and sisters. All right, cool. So why is all this playing a part? So now we kind of have to get into the cultural side of it. When we look at how things were set up back then, um, we look at the city. Corinth was a bustling city. It had a lot of people in it. It wasn't an agricultural town. So agricultural towns, um, they usually had a lot of people where they were, they have their own farms, they have their own cattle and so on and so forth. But it's kind of like a city. So not everybody had cattle and not everybody had that so they would have to go to like a meat market and they would get their food so you know think about it this way where we're at home we go to Kroger or Myers to go get some food and, and, and today we'll go get some pork chops and tomorrow we'll go get some lamb the next day we'll go get some steak or some hamburger some chicken they, they had a meat market too but you got to understand, these cities weren't as big as those components that at, the, the city wasn't as big as we are right now. All right. So therefore, there wasn't two Myers to go to and a Sam's Club and a Walmart and a Kroger. There wasn't all these extra save lots that you can go to. There was usually one location to go to. And so what Paul is saying that, you know, you got these meat markets you can go to. Oh, there's something we got to talk about. Where were these meat markets located? All right. Where were these meat markets located? So usually the way the cities were uh, set up. Remember, we live in the world, but not of the world. So Corinth was a city, a worldly city. The church at Corinth is a component within the city. It isn't the city itself. So there's a lot of worldly things going on. And back then in those times, there was a lot of pagan worship. And so in pagan worship, they did sacrifices and they sacrificed it to their gods. So we have them sacrificing meats to their gods. They would take the meat and they would sacrifice it. And then hold up. Let's go back. So. In that time, one of the components, we're, we're still, I'm going to hold that piece. So I'm going to give you a cliffhanger right now. We talk about meat markets. We talk about pagan worship. Now we're getting ready to go into the next component. And then we'll come back to this meat market and, and pagan stuff. So back in that time, um, when you look at the culture of the time, social events were super important. So you had social events. And so John would have, be in charge of, um, the social event for this week's night and then next week it would be this person and the next week it was that person so they would invite uh, people from the town there and you knew that Sally on this day was supposed to uh, have everybody over and have food and entertainment and so on and so forth and the next week it was someone else you had to do it uh, otherwise you'd be an outcast 
because uh, that social parties were so important back then. And so they would have these social parties and it surrounded food. So in the surrounding of food, people would come over, have an entertainment type, and then they would um, eat of the meat. They would eat of the food at the table. So you're sitting at the table, and what most people don't understand, and this is why context and understanding of the cu cultural side of it in exegesis is important. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, I know. I, I know. Give me just one second. I'm going to get him his bottle. Come on, buddy. Let's get you your bottle. I know. You hungry. So right before the nap, he ended up just I, waking up and just wanting to be held. And so now he got hungry. So, okay. So we were, so we're talking about the culture. It's kind of opening this scripture up even more. So the scripture is opening up even, even, even more. But there's something you got to know about these dinners. Remember I said it's a big social event. And if you don't hold them, then you end up being an outcast in the city. Um, your, 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 your perception of who you are is less if you're not holding these these parties and so what happens is let me tell you let me tell you what's happening at these parties so when they are sitting down to eat the first thing these parties are designed to worship and be honored to a god a pagan god so today it might be the sun guard God tomorrow. It might be the God of fertility. The next day it might be this one. And so that food that they're eating is being dedicated to those gods. And so Paul is talking about these folks from the church who are going to these parties. In essence, going to the bar like we were kind of talking, we're kind of getting around to it. So 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 but where did they get the meat from? Remember, we were talking, so, so they're having these social events that they're worshiping to the sun god uh, and they're dedicating the meat and everything, their whole meal to the sun god and so on and so forth. So then let's go over to the meat market again and to the, uh, the, 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 the sacrifice. Where are they getting their meat from? They're getting their meat from the meat market. Oh, but it goes deeper than that. It's not just any type of meat they're getting. They own because you know you didn't have these choice selections. Well, what was happening is the people uh and the pagan sanctuaries where they were worshiping, they ended up sacrificing an animal. And so when they sacrificed the animal, part of it was given to the leaders of the pagan temple, and the rest of it went to the meat market. And so that rest of that food that went to the meat, the rest of that meat that went to the meat market, the meat markets were usually placed right outside of the pagan temples. See, this is getting good. This is why it's so important to analyze the scripture. So you have sacrificed meat that's going to the meat marker market. This sacrificed meat was sacrificed to an idol, a fake god. And so it's now tainted meat and it's going to the meat market. So then that from the meat market, they're buying it and taking it to these social settings. And in these social settings, they're dedicating that whole meal to that God. And so Paul is saying, because they can't go to a mire and they can't go over here and they can't go over here. I need you to understand about the social setting that you're going to. Uh, because if, if these people who have tried to pull themselves out of that pagan world sees you going to those social settings, we're going to have a problem. You're going to have a problem if they fall and these think they can go. They haven't built themselves up with the knowledge you have. It goes back to the component of we got to really understand that we got to think of others as more important than ourselves. We got to go back to that component of love your neighbors as you would love yourself. Philippians, uh, what is it? Philippians two, 3 and 4 starts talking about think of others as more important than yourself. And so when you're going to these things, I need you to get out of your own head. I need you to stop worrying about the knowledge that you have and stop. I need you to think about your brothers and sisters. This is what Paul is telling all these folks. 
Exactly. The liquor stores that are post the same component. See, you're getting the revelation. It opens the scripture so that you can really see the revelation, so that you can really talk it. That's why breaking down the word and rightly defining the word can open up the fullness of the scripture so that you can open up uh, what you will receive from God in revelation. You're getting it. You're seeing it. And so when Paul is talking about them, he's talking about, you know, if, if, if my the food that I eat or even me going to those type of social settings causes my brother or sisters to fall. Um, I'm not going. I, I'd much rather be a vegetarian. And so I need you to have that same mindset. And on top of that, that food that you're getting is sacrificed to idols. What's wrong with you? You, I'd much rather you be vegetarians. So instead of going to that meat market where you know that the majority of that food and you're not going to be able to tell the difference between whether it's been sacrificed to a, a pagan God or if it's been sacrificed to um, it hasn't been sacrificed at all. You aren't going to really be able to tell. So now you're bringing in impure meat into your home. So I, I, it's probably better that since you can't go to a Meyer and you can't go to a Kroger and it doesn't have a package label on it to tell you that it was not GMO. Uh, it's better that you just don't eat that meat. Did that just open the scripture up for you? Hallelujah. We ain't done. We can't really go into revelation. We got to think of one another as more important. That whole scripture just breaking it down. And it, I can go even further and go deeper and, and, and increase the revelation. But it that 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 one verse, verse 13, just one verse created a whole sermon, created a whole increase in revelation, created. A, and, and it's all led by God, because that's why we have to have a relationship with God and have discernment increase and then have that. It, it, imagine how much more effective you are rightly dividing the word. See, God is calling us to a position of effectiveness and he's equipping us with tools and a skill set to be able to do that. And that component of exegesis, it even goes further. We can break it down even further. There's a, a, a lesson that I may present within our next couple days um, about breaking down the word that goes towards rainbow. And then also another word that breaks down the word Sophia, uh, wisdom, these components, uh, rainbow. People sit there and say, I see the rainbow over there. Well, what God is actually saying when you do a word study, what that is, is getting the word, looking back in its original context, uh, working to find out how it purely relates in that scripture. Because just because you see... Um, Sophia here and then Sophia there, even in the same chapter, does not mean it's talking about the same type of wisdom. The words themselves, um, they lose the fullness of their meaning when it has been translated from uh, Hebrew into English or Greek into English. or Because the Old Testament is primarily Hebrew and it has some Aramaic in it. The New Testament is primarily Greek. It loses translation with in the the when it tra changes over to different languages and English cannot fully um, explain the meanings of the word in its original form in its original language so that's why you got to do word studies and when you do these word studies and you start looking at rainbow and I'm going to use that you know the, the uh, since we're here and then we're going to get into the final revelation uh, when you look at rainbow uh, a lot of people say I see this rainbow in the sky and and they, then you see people running. I'm taking that rainbow back. I'm taking the com component of the rainbow back. What people don't understand, you are uh, running after a component that has really no true meaning. Because you don't even understand what God is saying about that. It ain't about the six different pretty colors. Yes, you can think about it and have this. He, he's kind of saying, if you see this rainbow, remember my covenant. But he's he, it goes deeper. When you look at that word um, and, and God is talking about that rainbow that we see, he's actually saying bow. Excuse me. My lips have been dry. Give me a second. I can't continue this. One second.
I'm coming. I tried to keep my um lips all keep it, but no, I, I couldn't do it anymore. All right. So when we look at the word rainbow, the actual word uh, is bow. And when you start breaking it down, what you understand about the bow, it is the bow like a weapon. And so God is saying that, yes, this rainbow that you see in the sky, I need you to understand what I'm telling you about this covenant that I placed in front of you. It's like a bow. And with a bow, that is a warrior. My bow is to symbolize I'm going to go to the lengths of the earth to make sure this uh, covenant comes to pass. I'm going to go to the length of the earth to protect this covenant. I'm going. Y'all ain't ready for this. God is saying, so that's why word study, breaking the word down and understanding. It's not just about this pretty rainbow that's in the air. It, it, God is saying that rainbow that I'm telling you is not just about, it's about me, uh, the intensity and the fullness that I'm going to go after this. I'm going to protect this covenant uh, even against you. The enemies can't get it. I'm protecting it. So, so therefore, I, I'm going to go and, and I'm going to chastise you. I'm going to... Jesus. Y'all, y'all. <laughs> Jesus. So that's why we can't just say, let me take this rainbow. Do you even understand the meaning of this rainbow? Is it, it, it you, you got to be able to wrap your mind around the fullness of it. Because otherwise that rainbow doesn't mean anything. That rainbow ain't just lucky charms at the end of it. That ain't the leprechaun at the end of it. That's just not a thing that's in the sky. Uh, God is saying, oh, I need you to really understand that rainbow that's up there is a bow. And it's a protection of the covenant. Now, the next part of it, I said, Sophia, there's a, it's about wisdom. But when you break down wisdom in this one section, uh, you start breaking down this wisdom. What you start seeing with the wisdom is in different ways that is used. Uh, it is uh, it has a slightly different meaning. And when you break it down, you get a whole different context of even the words. A lot of people see it as wisdom, 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 wisdom. But when you break it down in a word study, there's different levels of wisdom that God is trying to uh, to to uh, impart upon us that opens up the revelation. Hallelujah. So let's go to the last part of what we're talking about here. And that's in Matthew 22. Matthew 22. This is where we're going to get into the revelation and close out. I think he's almost done. Let me see one second here. feel better, huh? All right. He said, I'm ready. I'm back. All righty. Matthew 22. Where are you? So this is getting, we're getting ready to get into the part where God is talking about why rightly dividing the word is effective. We have already seen it. But let me talk about it from this perspective. Matthew 22, verse 34. says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. We can even go to the other one and talk about that. So before that, he had actually silenced the Sad Sadducees. Silence them, cause them to stop talking. But Jesus has silenced the Sadducees. They gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest, uh, great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. So they were asking him, they were trying to trap Jesus to say that he's God and all this stuff and so they can crucify him and all this stuff. And the lawyers with their slick uh, view and understanding of the law, they because they, you remember 
when we look at the Old Testament, we have to understand that the Old Testament was not written when Jesus was here. The Old Testament was being walked out. So all they had reference to actually was the Old Testament. That's a big thing. A lot of people think that, oh, Jesus, they're telling the story. No, Jesus was actually walking this out. And what was happening as we read it is sort of we can take ourselves back there. What was said here wasn't already said before until that moment. And so he said, so he and and he didn't have reference to the rest of the New Testament where Paul had written because Paul had was wasn't even in a Paul yet. He was still if he was alive, then he was Saul. So, so, so Jesus hadn't got to that point because he hadn't elevated. So, so that all that other stuff didn't happen. So all they were referencing was the Old Testament. But he said, that's the first thing you expect me to come back and say, I'm God and all this stuff. I already know in your mind, but let me tell you this. So it answered his question and it still left the idea open, but they really couldn't answer because all they could see is what does it say? Man looks upon the outward appearance. God searches the heart. They can only see the outward thing. But God says, dig deeper. My, his parables and his responses had a deeper meaning. If we can walk through and talk like Jesus and act like Jesus and behave like Jesus, um, we'll see so many different changes. The thing is, how do we get to that point? It's not just by the surface component. It's about right, rightly dividing the word. And then as we really understand it, we really know how to implement that and put that into our lives. Not only are we able to implement that and put that into our, our lives more effectively, we're also able to, um, when we pray to God, bless you, Sister Amy, when we're able to pray to, when we pray to God, we are also able to pray to him more effectively. When God reveals to us, we're able to, he's able to reveal it to us even more effectively. And so then when we see the nuances of the conversation he has with us, we can see the spirit of the thing and not just the surface of the thing. Hallelujah. So it says he answered them that. So then the next thing he said, and the second is like, is, is lucky. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So what he's saying with that last sentence is on these two commandments, uh, it suffices to answer every component of the law. If you walk in these two things, it will answer every component of the law. So what is the law? It's Moses's law. So in essence, where it says thou shall not kill. Thou shall not covet, uh, so on and so forth. If you're walking in these two commandments, it answers those things. So, so, so we don't have to, that's why he says we don't live by the law. We live by the spirit of the law. So if we're walking in the spirit of the law, uh, if we're walking in love, if we're walking through um, God as the head, if we're doing those things, we answer the law. It's already solved. We don't even have to worry about following the law because if we follow just the law, we're never going to win. But we follow the spirit of the law and we walk in the spirit of the thing. Now we have a greater chance of success to get to heaven. We have a greater chance of success to even live our lives daily. Uh, we, we will win more than we will lose. But if you're following the tenants, it's sort of like micromanaging. If you micromanage every dollar, you get stressed out and then you start losing money and you start doing this. But if you start living in the spirit of the law, you can start capitalizing on that money. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, early in my life, I would take a budget and I'll budget to the penny. And, and I can only spend five dollars over here and Two dollars over here, and oh, I can't only. Then an emergency happened. I wasn't able to do it. Then, as I got older, I kind of started moving into the spirit of the law. I knew I had these expenses, and then I set out this much to go into savings. I set out this much to go into an emergency fund, and then I set out this month to be to to just spend and splurge, however I wanted to do. And so I had two hundred dollars every month to go spend and splurge. I had it at the end of the month, and I, so the next month I had $200, so if I waited to the end of the month and I waited to the beginning, I could actually put both of those together, and now, now I have $400 if I really want to do it. And then I will make sure that I end up, um, I will make sure that I end up, um, 
I lost my train of thought. I do apologize. Oh, so I have $400 or I have $200. Then I can just spend it as I want to. I don't feel bad about it. I don't have any issues about it. So that's kind of like the spirit of the law. Now I can play and I can I can go buy a Bible here today. I can go buy a shirt over there. I don't feel bad because I overspent. Well, I can't overspend because I'm with, still within my $200, you know? If I have an issue with that comes up, I have the emergency fund. It's been building up, so I don't have to go over it. Oh, I need to go over it. Let me use some of my discretionary fund. I built it to where that I could live by the spirit of the budgeting and still get all of my bills paid. And living that way, I got to the point where I was able to pay my bills one, two, three months in advance. I got to the point where I can live for the next six months without having to worry about the bills. Not because of any extra but god has been extra he has been amazing he's been given an overflow but because of the being the steward over little and then living in the spirit of the thing the overflow and and what god has given me has been able to be set so that i can still live and not have to do anything but his will all right let's go on I, that was just in my spirit this read so we're going to close out here with this uh verse 41 now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ uh, whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. This is what they told Jesus. He said, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is the Christ? So they all know that Christ is coming. They all know that Christ, that Christ was coming this way and, and, and he's going to end up coming. They, they don't even believe that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, they keep testing him, and they even testing him here. Uh, and, but Jesus said, let me ask them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, the son of David. He said, okay, gotcha. He said, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? How does David call his son Lord? David is alive, and he's calling God Lord. He's calling Christ Lord. He, he's realizing Christ. How is David calling him Lord? You see, it goes here. This, this is what he says. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Jesus had a way of answering to shut the party down. He had a way of responding to shut the party down. How did he do it? He was a scholar of the word. How was he a scholar of the word? Because he is the word. How was he able to understand the fullness of the word and when to use it? Because he is the word. He knows the word. He knows what the fullness of the word is. He knows how to use the word. He knows when to use it. He knows in what context to use it. He knows the word because he is the word. He is the creator of it all. And so when we look at this scripture, he is talking to the Pharisees. He's already shut down the Sadducees. And now he's shutting down the Pharisees to the point that they were embarrassed because it says here in 46, no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. He knows himself. No one was able to answer him a word. Nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. They didn't want to ask him another question. Good, good blessings, uh, Sister Tamar. Um, they didn't want to ask him another question because, because they were embarrassed. He showed up and showed out. He used the word and set them in their place. He went forth and said, you know, let's, let's, let's use your logic. Let me, sort of like Paul did with uh, the, the, those folks in Corinth, let me use your logic. It, you, saying, you, you saying that he's the son of David. See, see, what they didn't understand the fullness of that scripture was he was coming from the line of David. And how did he come from the line of David? He came from the line of David being conceived from a virgin. God implanted himself within Mary to be born through a portal 
so that he could experience what it is like to be man to demonstrate to us what it's like to be man. And the only way that he can go through the fullness to receive and be born as sin for sin to be the answer for sin is to come through the portal, the same portal that we come through. How do I know that we come? It's a portal uh, that we come through because it says before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. He knew knew us in the spirit realm. He knew us in that capacity. We had a relationship with him in that capacity. When we had that relationship, then he placed us into the womb. And when he placed us into the womb, mixtured with the sperm and the egg, and it created us, our spirit meshed with all of that. And we were born through a portal, which is the mother, which is the woman. He had to enter through the same portal, through the same gate that we did so that his uh his accomplishment of of being born uh excuse me let me back up so that the revelation of him dying for our sin and paying a cost would have accomplished the thing that it was called to do it, it had to come through the same way we were born in essence uh adam was born free but then once he was kicked out of eden uh all the descendants because you know it says in the scripture that adam was made in his image in in the likeness of the three and the likeness of God uh, and all of his manifestation, all of his manifestations, uh, making one God, not the Trinity, oneness. Uh, God is one. Uh, but what I'm trying, we can teach on that later. Uh, but what I'm trying to convey is he, Adam was made in God's likeness. But if you look forward and you go, uh, 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 if you pour the portal equals answer, amen. And you go and under, look at the scripture after Adam was kicked out of Eden, Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, the Garden of Eden. Uh, look at the scripture. It says, and then his sons, his children were made in Adam's image. And what is Adam's image? Sin. So God had to come forth in, in that image. He had to come forth through that portal that we come through in sin, being sin, born being sin, to answer the call. He couldn't just come in in any way. He had to do it the same way we did. And so that's what he did. But why is rightly dividing the word so important? Why is it effective? It is showing you, he's, he's showing you here. He's showing you here in Matthew 22, that, that last scripture. Verse 40, I believe it was, that it shut them down. He had just shut down the Sadducees. Now he shut down the Pharisees. They didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the people because uh, God was able to use the word effectively. He rightly divided the word. And when you rightly divide the word and present it in the spirit of God, just as he did, uh, then they have to shut down. They can't come back with an answer. There's no answer to be had. These people walking in the Pharisees and Sadducees, they won't have an answer. It'll shut it down. People have seen today. I actually showed my folks in the background. Uh, uh, there was a way that God had me answer a situation today based off of even this set of scriptures. Uh, he had me answer it in a certain way and it shut the conversation down. Uh, you don't have to argue with everybody. You don't have to have a Jesus. You don't have to argue. Give him the word. Give him the essence of the word. Give him the spirit of the word. Give him the revelation of the word. Give him the rhema of the word. Give him what God released to you and watch it shut down the entire conversation. They know that it shut down the whole conversation and I didn't argue. I walked with truth with boldness. I didn't argue with them. I didn't have a, 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 a ill moment with them. I wasn't upset with them. I just laid it with truth and boldness as God told me to do it and it's all rooted in the word. You can sit there and see people who think that you got to give them these exact scripture all the time. You got to understand how God has us walking. Know the scripture. 
so you can understand what God is conveying. God doesn't tell us he's going to give us a new car. God doesn't tell us, uh, talk about it in the scripture. God doesn't tell us he's going to give us a new laptop. He doesn't tell us that we're going to have uh, these Jordans or whatever the case, blessings he's going to pour out on us. Uh, but we know that God gave it to us. Uh, but guess what? I don't have Jordans. Can you tell them about God working specifically in your life and find it in scripture? Exactly. You can't. But you can walk in the heaven. God poured out his blessings on my life in overflow. In excess. He used a good measure. Pressed down, shaking together, pouring over into Jesus. Y'all ain't y'all. That, that, that's, that's not hitting somebody. It's all right. It's all right. Understand what God is telling us in this season. We got to be able to walk in the spirit of the thing. We got to hear what God is telling us and how to convey it. It will be rooted in the word. It'll be rooted in the essence of him. It will be rooted. Every word that I spoke, they can look, they've seen what happened and they understand that the same exact thing occurred. We got to get to the point where we are shutting down conversation, nonsensical conversations in the way that God shows us to not in our from our spirit. Too many people want to speak from their spirit and they wonder why they keep having to repeat the same thing over and over. And next thing you know, their anger is built up. Their fear is built up. Their lack of confidence. They've come out of character. It's because they didn't hear God. It's because they didn't understand the fullness of the scripture. They because they couldn't understand the fullness of the scripture they couldn't even speak it they couldn't even speak it clearly they couldn't even speak what was necessary see sometimes y'all don't understand it's the, yes it's the word of God that is superpower but imagine speaking the spirit of the God oh, Jesus because when Jesus spoke he spoke the word of God but then he answered them he said so if David answered him Lord how is he the son of God? See, that was the spirit of the thing speaking. Jesus. Because remember, Jesus was walking out the New Testament. Paul, when he got to his phase, he was walking out the New Testament. The New Testament had not been created here on earth until it was walked out. They were referencing the Old Testament in their New Testament walk. Jesus. So rightly dividing the word will bring about the revelation, will bring about the rhema, the revelation, what comes from God. The rhema, it still comes from God, but it, rhema, it's a right now word. God is calling us to walk in the fullness of his word. That is the actuality of the word as well as the spirit of it. God is calling us to new heights and, and we have to understand how to walk effectively effectively it's not about us it's not about our emotions and we got to understand what our purpose is uh, we are here just like Paul said uh, in first Corinthians 1 uh, we are here for God was it one or eight one of those two we were just talking about we are here for God's purposes we ain't here to satisfy our own soul and our own spirit we are here to satisfy his his purposes his agenda and so if you got to answer them out of your own emotions, you should already know you're out of order. If you answer another person out of your own emotions, you're out of order. Did God give you that righteous indignation? Awesome. Walk in it as he called us to. But did he give you that sadness? Get out of your way. Did he give you that depression? Get out of your way. Did he give you that anger uh, that's calling them all types of B's and W's and H's and whatever else? A, B, C, D, E, F, G's. Uh, you can call somebody a chair and it's you understand the spirit of the thing. We got to get out of our own way and start walking in the fullness of the word. It begins with rightly dividing the word and allowing God to release the revelation. You cannot walk forth and be anything in Christ if you don't go forth. 
and really re well, rightly divide the word. You need to understand how the word and the spirit agree. You got to understand how it plays a part. You got to understand how to utilize it. God is calling us to effectiveness. God can use us all, but if we're not walking in the right spirit, we will be just like those men who said, I did this in Jesus' name. I did this in your name. I prophesied in your name. I baptized in your name. I did this and I did that. And Jesus is going to come and say, you know what? Oh, y'all now want to speak to the manager. Here's the manager. My name is Jesus. Uh, I'm going to have a conversation with you uh, right now. You you did it in my name. Uh, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you helped me get a few new customers. I thank you for getting me a few new customers into the building. Uh, but you know what? I never knew you. I don't even know why you were doing it. Walking in this place with that spirit, doing it in that spirit. Those spirits weren't of me. See, some people don't understand. They're going to get up there and be shocked when God says, I never knew you. Because you, they think that just reading the word, uh, as the word says, and walking without understanding the power, the power in the spirit of the thing is power. How do I know in the the spirit of the thing is power. In Acts 1 and 8, it says, and Jesus spoke this. Jesus, while he was spending 40 days uh, with the disciples, uh, Jesus said this, when, uh, when the uh, Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power and ability. It is in the spirit spirit where you get the power. It is in the spirit where you get ability. It is not just the written word as it's written. You got to have both. You got to have an understanding of the word and you have to have a connection to the father. You got to have a connection to God. You have to have a connection to Jesus. You got to be able to walk with the power that he's releasing. It is These are words if you do not connect it to the father. These are just words if you do not connect it to God. These are words if you don't connect it to Jesus. If you don't allow the spirit of the thing to work. If you don't allow the spirit of the thing to move. If you don't understand. Jesus. Jesus. How see some, some, some folks are like that, that sounds like some weird, strange doctrine. That ain't some strange doctrine. It's rooted in the word. And it ain't perverting the word either. Because God is showing what, what's happened is uh, uh, the word has been perverted for so long that the real word is sounding strange. God is tearing down some false altars. How do I know? And confidently say that the words written on this page, just as the words written on the page without the spirit of God are just words on the page. Because in this book, it shows the seven sons of Sceva. And they started and they were seeing what Paul was doing when they were seeing what Paul was doing in the name of Jesus. They saw signs, miracles, and wonders occur. And these exorcists, uh, uh, they saw some demonic components going on. These seven sons of the one Skeva, one of the Skevas, uh, the priest in the area. They saw some things going on and they were trying to go in and, 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 and do their thing, but their thing wasn't working. But they saw what Paul was doing. When they saw what Paul was doing... Jesus. They said, it has to be in that name. Oh, yes, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus. The name has power. Oh, the blood still has power. Oh, but if you're lacking the spirit of the thing, if you're lacking the walk in it, if you're lacking it, if you're lacking the revelation from God, if you're lacking the fullness from God, if you're lacking, those are just words and they don't mean anything. How do I know that? The seven sons of Sceva tried it. Uh, they went up to that demon and they had a conversation and they were trying to cast out that demon uh, through the name of Jesus. Uh, as they were trying to cast out that demon, uh, uh, what we found is that demon started speaking 
looking back. What did that demon say? Oh, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Oh, but who are you? But who are you? Let me tell you, and you just can't say the name Jesus and there'll be power. You got to have a connection to the source. You got to be connected. You got to understand the spirit of the thing and be connected. You got to walk in the spirit of the thing. You got to walk with God and allow him to walk with you. You got to allow God to be through your whole being. You got to, Jesus. Right after that, the seven sons of Skeba got pounced on by the man carrying that demon because the demon was controlling that man and they beat he beat them to a pulp causing them to run out naked see if we ain't walking in the spirit of the thing and we don't understand that's why some folks can't get from under depression that's why some folks can't get free uh, from their financial crisis that's why because they trying to speak the name Jesus but they have no relationship with the name Jesus or the person who carries that name they have no relationship with the spirit of it when Jesus uh, elevated he elevated and poured out his spirit he gave his spirit because what he was full of the Holy Spirit Jesus when he was walking in and they were dealing with Jesus he was full of the Holy Spirit he was full of himself he had himself Pouring out through his breath, veins and and even though he was hungry, the devil tried to test him, but he had the right words. He understood the power of the spirit. He understood the uh, integral nature of the spirit. He understood how the spirit needed to work. God is saying that you just can't say my name and sit there and think that it's going to work unless I decide, because he says, uh, I shall be gracious to whom I shall be gracious to it. Exodus 33. Oh, I, and I'll be compassionate to whom I'll be compassionate to. He says these things. So we don't want to block God in a box. But gosh, why can't we just get it together and just start walking in the spirit? We want to be free, but we're not willing to do the work. We want to be free, but we're not willing to get in his face. We're willing to be free, but we're not willing to ask him to do what we need to be cleansed and purified. We're not willing to do the hard work. God God is saying this, that time is up. Those seven sons of Sceva didn't want to go through the processing that Paul had to go through. They wouldn't have wanted to go through the process that Peter or Timothy had to go through. They didn't even want to have to deal with the death that Timothy had to deal with and Peter had to deal with. Uh, but God says sometimes you got to go through some things to get to where I need you to be to understand the fullness of me. Then you can understand and connect to me. So when you do speak my name. Uh, the access you have to heaven opens up doors and angels come flying out on your behalf. They, You put the blood of Jesus. You got protection. Oh, let them cross the blood of Jesus when you uh, uh, spread out the true blood of Jesus. They don't want to cross that line because crossing... Uh, see, some of us have actually been delivered uh, and, and people still want to put their mouth on you. Uh, but what God is saying is... Uh, uh, let them. Don't worry about what's happening. He's giving you the direction. Listen to him. Hear him. Get closer to him so he can tell you how to handle that situation. But some of those situations are just peace be still and know that I am God. Uh, because if they cross that blood that God has cast over that situation and they start speaking into it, uh, hell and damnation are their portion. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And y'all don't believe me. Let me tell you how serious God is. God's taking me into a whole different planet. We got to close out of here. Uh, we've been on here for two, almost two hours, three more minutes or so. Uh, no, seven more minutes, two hours. We ain't ready to get off here. Uh, uh, but God said, when you look at Moses and you hear, see Korth, Dathan, and Abiram. What we find about Korth, Dathan, and Abiram is that they came to rebel against Moses. And, and they're like, you know, God talks to us, so why do we need you anymore? And they had all these other folks with them and all this stuff. They even had their households and all this stuff. And then God saw that happening, and he was angry. See, there's what people don't understand 
is that when you come up against someone who is anointed and who God has put in place, uh, you're not coming up against what you see that serve. See, this is why it's dangerous to judge people based off of appearances. It's dangerous uh, to look on the account, uh, uh, outer appearance and just judge them because they thought they were coming up against Moses. But when you come up against one of God's anointed that he has put in place, uh, whether you like it or not, whether you think they should be there or not, whether you have access or not, but you start sitting there and speaking up in rebellion. See, that's the worst kind of rebellion because you're not coming up against Moses. You're actually coming up against God. Uh, you don't believe me what happened when Saul was having a conversation with Jesus on the road to Damascus Jesus didn't say why are you persecuting my people Jesus came down he said why are you persecuting me God takes it personal when his people are touched God takes it but they didn't even touch him they had the intention of touching him and, and, and Korah Datham and Abiram oh God caused God to be angry so angry that God was going to take them all out except for Moses and Aaron oh, God was about to take all of them out and, but uh, Moses uh, intervened and intervened Assessed on their behalf and, and because of the relationship, Exodus 33 and 11 had a face-to-face -face type of relationship where they could have that f conversation and, 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 and God was able to speak to them in certain ways where, where Jesus, y'all hear me? Y'all hear what God is saying at this moment? Thank you, Lord. Oh, what I am trying to communicate to you is that's why relationship is so important because you could actually save some people because God intended uh, to take them all out but because Moses intervene because Moses intercessed on their behalf. He said okay, uh, I won't take them all out but I'm still going to get those fools. <laughs> I'm going to open up the, pit, the, the ground and allow them to go to the pits of hell alive. And God opened up the ground and they went to hell oh, alive and so did those connected to them. We ain't done yet. But then later the people of Israel rose up against God, uh, Moses again, and they didn't get the understanding. You can, it says, touch not my anointed. This is showing you, you can't even have the intention on touching God's anointed. So that's why we got to walk with confidence that God got it, that vengeance is mine. He rose up again, search Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Get those scriptures, go into work and read the story. You will sit there and be like, oh, God. Because most people say, just touch not my anointed. It goes deeper than that. You can't even have the intention to do it. Oh, uh, last piece I'm going to uh, uh, mention before I close out of here. <laughs> uh, uh, you remember Judas? Uh, see, see, Judas went and he handled a situation. Uh, that situation was an unrighteous situation, but it was ne necessary for a righteous move, for a righteous agenda, for uh, us to get uh, free from our bondage and have a way out so a debt could be paid uh, that we couldn't even pay but Jesus was born for this thing he was born and created uh, not created he was on earth he was created he was born for this thing uh, to go and die on the cross but see when Judas let me let me tell you something when Judas uh, uh, had the conversation uh, and, 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 and he, he, he what we, what, oh Jesus what we understand is that Mo, uh, Judas was going through and he was taking the pence the, the 30 cents from from them he, when he went through Jesus whoever's attacking needs to stop because I ain't worried Hallelujah. When Jesus told Judas to go forth, when he told him to go forth and go ahead and uh, do what you got to do, there's a reason why he did it because the thing had to come to pass. But when Judas, when Judas, when Judas ended up having this conversation with the soldiers and he sold out, it wasn't the time when Judas had actually uh, gone and taken the money. It wasn't the time when Judas had pointed Jesus out by kissing him that he had um, sinned against Jesus. It was the time that he had made up in his mind that he sinned. 
He hadn't even done the act. That's how serious it is. Our decisions start in our mind. The moment we make up in our mind to do something is the moment we've sinned. Uh, it's not when uh, some people sit there and think, oh, I sinned when I slept with this woman and I'm married. Oh, I sinned when I slept with this man and I'm married. No, it was the moment you made up in your mind that you were going to sin and you hadn't even done the actual act. It just was waiting for it to manifest and then it manifested, but you had already sinned in your mind. God is saying in this season, I need you to make up your mind to choose me. I need you to make up your mind to walk my way. I need your, you to make up your mind to rightly divide the word and walk it out. It wasn't until you made up your mind. That's when you made the choice to walk righteously. That's when you began to walk, work, walk righteously. That's when you began to do the right thing. That's when you God saw that you were holy. That's when God saw that you had shifted. That's what happened. It is not when it manifested. It's when you made up your mind. The way God works, uh, you bind things on earth and loose things on earth. And the same thing happens in the spirit. But it has to come back down and manifest. When you made up your mind, it hit the spirit realm. And then it has to manifest. Uh, that's what why God is shifting our mind. That's why God is giving us the tools. That's why the devil keeps trying to attack your mind. Because if it is made up, see, a, a Christian or a servant of Jesus with a made up mind is a dangerous thing to the devil. Hallelujah. So calling you forth, let's get further into study. Let's really get into studying the word. Let's get into releasing the word as Jesus has us releasing it. Let's have a mind made up mind. A lot of people just say these words and they don't understand the spirit of them. Oh, but when you get the spirit Oh, that's what Jesus is saying, that these two commandments, they answer the requirements for the law and what the prophets stand on. That's the reason, because it's the spirit of the thing that answers it. It's the spirit of the thing that makes it come to pass. It's the spirit of the thing. We got to walk in the spirit. Oh, we got to walk in the spirit. Hallelujah. In the mighty master's name, Jesus. Hey, I pray this bless you all. Whew. If you didn't watch it from the beginning, catch it from the beginning because uh, God gave us some exegetical tools to be able to break down the word, to get a little bit stronger in the word, or not a little bit, a lot bit. Uh, God is moving us to excellence. Uh, he's moving us to elevation. Um, the devil tried to stop me from speaking, even tried to tie my tongue, but I was still getting it out. I don't care what it looked like. The spirit of the thing is still going on out. The devil can't stop me. So that's the thing. When you're effective in the word of Christ. You know. There's two reasons. We have issues. First reason we have issues. Is because of self and it ain't the devil. A lot of our issues is because of the choices we made. The devil don't need to jump in if we already ruin our own life. And we're already messing everything up. But it's when we start walking and, 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 and walk with a changed mind. You know, everybody want to blame it on the devil and blame this on the devil. Mm -mm, not everything is the devil. But I, let me tell you, when you walk with a changed mind, when you walk in the fullness of God, when you walk in... And the devil knows your name. Didn't know the names of the seven skeevas, but knew the name of Paul. Uh, when you walk like that and the devil knows your name, the devil is going to try to come at you. Going to try to get you out of the way. Going to try to get you moved because you are a threat to his plan. And then the devil is going to move and start trying to cause things. But he's, he's still a defeated foe. He still can't move you. And you're going to keep And when you get strong in the word of God and you allow the spirit of the thing to really move and you start walking in that spirit, the devil can't move you. You see him like, I got you. I know what you're doing, but you ain't going to stop me. When you let the spirit of the thing move, when you allow the spirit of the thing and the devil attack you, but you know what? Resist the devil and he should flee. I finished, didn't I? I ain't worried about him. 
But what I am going to say is the word of God, it shall go out. It shall do the thing that it's called to do. The devil can try to stop me, but not until I'm finished with what God has called me to do. When God's ready for me to go, I'm going to go. But until then, I'm going to still preach the word, how God called me to preach it. I'm going to teach the word, how God called me to teach it. We are in a time that we cannot stop. We're in a time that we cannot move. We got to get our way. Oh, I was reading. Yes, Habakkuk is amazing. I taught on. Habakkuk when we were doing the prescription, the 300 uh, broadcast a lot back in March uh, 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 ver chapter 1 and 2 especially uh, but you know, gotta give us what we need so we gotta, we gotta be focused stop worrying about it, don't let self get in the way Habakkuk had to sit on the ramparts because he was having this conversation back and forth with God that first conversation these folks are horrible how how dare you not work and then God said okay I got you I'll work I'm going to raise the Chaldeans and the 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 uh the Babylonians against you uh against the people and they horrible people and then you got these other folks I mean, then you got him coming back saying, you're not that type of God. Now, hold up. God just said he's that type of God. And you're going to sit there. Too many of us get in the way and put ourselves in the way and try to put God in a box. But good thing about Habakkuk 2 and 1, he got on the ramparts and checked himself. He said, oh, hold up. I got to check myself. Let me get on these ramparts. Let me wait so that I can hear what God's saying. I'm going to open myself up so much that I'm going to wait and be vulnerable. I'm going to be vulnerable to him. So if he has to reprove me, I'm going to be open for his reproof. I'm going to stand here and God can do what he needs to do with me because you know what? I, I, I was wrong. I, that's what he's saying in that section. I was wrong. I, I got to check myself because you know, I put myself, I, I, I was, I was talking to God at a higher pay grade than I actually am. <laughs> Jesus. I was, I'm at a higher pay grade than I, I I'm supposed to be. Glory. So, so I need to put myself in, in check. You know, myself is, it, it keeps getting in the way. So, so I'm going to put myself in check. And then he says, uh, God says, uh, I, 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 uh, I need you to, uh, write the vision and make it plain upon tables so those who may see it may run away. But it wasn't just the vision. A lot of people just stick at the vision, but the vision ain't what God is talking about. When you exegize the text and do a word study on the word vision in its original text, what you find is that word is, is not just vision it is revelation of God says I need us to stop working in lower level understanding and move up into revelation get the lower level understanding that's the beginning of the thing go into the revelation that only I can release to you the revelation is the thing that causes people to move when it's tied to the Holy Spirit that thing moves and people, it, it's, it's not even just writing it on, 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 on stone tablets. A lot of people think it's just write the vision on the stone. See, y'all got me teaching a whole nother lesson. Uh, we gonna do, I, I'll be through here in a second. Uh, it's not just writing it on the stone tablets. Uh, you can write it on your email. You can write it in your phone. You can write it on some paper. You can see, see, some of us don't understand what, what, what God is saying is that you need to be able to write the vision so people can run with it. So, so let me use an example. You in the middle of cooking and you're on the stove cooking and then all of a sudden an important phone call comes do you got somebody around you who can go and pick up the direction and finish that meal who's ready who's been waiting to go and pick up those directions and run and get that done while you're on the phone call oh, oh let me take it to another level oh you sat there and you had a situation where you're at work and all of a sudden God took you out for a week because you needed to go and either rest Rest, or you needed to go and do this, but but you wrote your vision, you wrote the revelation of the vision, because that's what God wants written down. It's not the vision He wants written down. He wants the revelation of the vision. If you need to write the vision down, write it down. But realize you're not finished until He releases the revelation of the thing. When He releases the revelation of the thing, that's what you show to the others. That's what you hand out. When God is saying. So you got sick and, and God set you down for a moment and, and not because you got sick because God really, he just needed you to rest for a moment uh, or, or, or God sent you on a different assignment 
But this one assignment, uh, you got to have some people around you in your inner circle that can read it and their spirit jumps with it. See, when you have something, a divine thing, we talked about this the other day. Uh, God got me jumping all over this to give this one example. Uh, when Mary came in the presence of Eliz uh, Elizabeth and John was in the belly of Elizabeth and Jesus was in the belly of Moses. Uh, when Mary walked in, the baby leapt. That's the same understanding. Uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus will make the divine thing in another person leap. Uh, I'm just telling you if you carry in something divine. And so that's what God is sitting here. Uh, <laughs> and that's what God is sitting here understanding is that when he sits there, let me see. Glory to God. Many people overlook God's word. Extra, that's the perversion of the word. Perversion of the word. That's why this lesson is so important. But going back, so when the baby leaps, uh, when that baby leaps, it should call someone else to do it. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important. And when God gives something divine, it should cause the divine thing in another to leap. So when you get the word from God and he has you take the revelation and he has you write it on a tablet, the Holy Spirit will take control. He will take control and allow it to run into the next person and then while you are down you wake up and they say it's done you're like well, how'd that happen because i saw your vision and it caused something in me to leap to get the vision that you wrote down and caused me to run with it oh it don't have to be just on paper how about we start writing it on the tables of our heart let it seep down in us and go out but see see we got to remember that in I, I think it was isaiah that said that god will give the end of the thing at the very beginning and so the same thing when we look going further down into Habakkuk, uh, the scripture says that, you know, I'm giving you the, 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 the matter at hand uh, and it, it is going to come to pass. And even though it may take a little bit of time or at least seem like it's taking a little bit of time, it's actually running to the end. Don't, don't, don't stress yourself. It's running to the end, even though it may seem like it's taking a, a little bit of time and it's, it's taking longer than normal. Don't worry about it, though it may tarry, though it it may tarry. Oh, it's still going to come. It, it may seem like it's going to de delay, but it shall come to pass. <laughs> we got to understand and see when God's in the control, that thing will happen. There may be a little trouble on the front end. Uh, there's going to be some peace. And on the back end, there may be a little lot more trouble. But God is saying, just like the crucifixion, I, I walked this earth and I died on the cross. Your thing may think it may look like it may have died. It may look like it may have gone down and it's not going to live again. But that thing, if it's a divine thing, it shall rise. It shall ascend. God is calling forth ascension. He's calling forth effectiveness. That's why we got to understand his word. That's why we got to understand his prescription. That's why we got to understand the root of it. Because it's not just the vision God is trying to release. He's trying to release the revelation of it. The fullness of it. Y'all been asking God to show you his glory and he said I'm ready. But wait. You can't because you've got a cap on the box. Take off the cap. Hallelujah. Alright. I gotta quit. Y'all gonna have me preaching here all night. I pray the word bless you, Jesus. I pray the probably three or four words bless you because God is moving. Y'all be blessed. Have a great night. We will see you next time. Share this video with somebody. Um, be a blessing to somebody else. Um, the other piece is if you haven't caught any of the other videos, go on YouTube. We got the link up above. Go check it out. Um, share this blessing with somebody else. It can change somebody somebody's life. I pray uh, help elevate yours because God is elevating us. He is elevating us. He is moving us into a greater dynamic. See, this whole season has been about kingdom order and kingdom strategy, kingdom elevation. God is doing something in the kingdom. If we aren't listening, if we aren't paying attention, if we aren't positioned correct, it's going to go right over our heads. God is saying, I am fighting hard. I'm sending my messengers to speak my word to get you positioned because I not only do I need you to do some things uh, with your hands, I need you to speak something. I need you. See, see, I, I, I can't close yet. I got to hit this piece. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. One will chase a thousand, two will put ten thousand to flight. Hallelujah. One will chase somebody needs this. That's why I can't get off. And so so I I am a firm believer of yielding to the Holy Spirit. And if we aren't willing to allow God's word to fully get out, 
and fully do the thing it's called to do. What are we doing? We got to be able to be willing to walk it. But one will chase a thousand, two will pit ten thousand to flight. We, I, I put everything into the word that I give out because I know. See, see, we talked about this the other day. People often use this phrase that preach to one like you got a thousand in the room or a thousand people are going to come. And, and, and it's really like a selfish kind of component that you're going to get it. But 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 I, I, I don't really live by that view i believe in preaching to one like they are a thousand i i believe in re- preaching to one like they reach a thousand i preach to one like they're going to effect a thousand i preach to two if two are in the mix like they're going to go and touch ten thousand i don't care what people think the anointing shall go out and do the very thing that it's going to it's called to do that word will go out and flow in and that person that's sitting there that person on this live that has been jesus who has been waiting for the opportunity to move god has said move yeah i placed it in your spirit you know what god is been telling you to do uh something about somebody with trees i don't know what this is trees ornaments pine trees uh bag with oh, jesus i don't know what that is about but god is saying uh somebody is creative uh, and they've been looking to put like gift things together and and, and when you put those gift things together it was and one is to give out to people who are supposed to be helped and the other piece is uh, uh for a business component and, and it's already been processed. There's, the things have already been started to be in work and, and didn't know if it was supposed to go in that way. But, but God is saying that thing was supposed to happen. That thing was supposed to happen. But God has been sitting there saying, we got to get to the point where we don't care about outside appearances. We don't care about what other people are, are saying. We got to understand what God is saying directly to us. And, and, and the messenger has got to be willing to be like the, 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 the shepherd who went after the one. He gave him his whole self to the one. He went after him with his whole self. He didn't leave any piece of him behind. He went after him with his whole self. So when we are preaching to one, we need to understand that that one will reach a thousand. When we look at two, that two will reach ten thousand. We need to be filling them up and equipping them and placing them in position to be successful to do that very thing. So if they go hand in hand, they can go and reach the ten thousand. If they go by themselves, one thousand. Imagine what God is doing when he can Next is all together. You got one will chase a two thousand, uh, a thousand. Two will chase ten thousand. Then you put three. There's exponential increase. Start preaching into people like preaching to them. Because if we get, if one person gets a thousand people, and they preach in them into them to the fullness, they will reach the globe over and over and over. And if we're doing it unto God, because that's the only way we'll be able to reach a thousand is because of our, our, our God doing the work to connect the rest of the pieces and all of that spirit that's moving and causing people to run and run and run. God is sitting here saying, well, oh, that 10,000 and so on and so forth. God is saying that we can reach the whole globe. Every person on this earth. Multiple times over. If we start putting the intensity and uh, the focus into each person like they are beyond important. Think of others as more important than yourselves is what the scripture in Philippians says. Others are important. Y'all have a great night. Tune in to the next one. As soon as I can get it up there, next next one I will, uh, however God leads. Pay attention to YouTube. We'll get this one up, but we have all the other lives up there too. Uh, I, God is calling us to ascension and effectiveness. He's calling us to uh, precision and accuracy. He doesn't want us to. He, he's tired of us throwing all five stones. And every time we throw five stones at the one target, we've been missing the target. We might hit, hit their shoulder. God said, I need you to have some precision. That's why he's teaching us these skills. And we'll walk through more confidently more successfully and we just got to understand we got to stop getting distracted by what all these other people say you know they may not understand your assignment don't be like that old prophet don't be the young prophet getting distracted by the old prophet and if y'all old prophets get out the way 
<laughs> Don't distract the young prophet. Yeah, the old prophet was wrong too. But see, the thing is, the young prophet, because he disobeyed God, a, a direct commandment, the lion, the tiger, lion, um, ate him. Killed him. We got to be willing to step out and do what God says. You have two things, and then I'm closing. Test all things. Go back and watch this video. Go look at some of the other videos on YouTube. When you're done, go back and search the scriptures. Get in prayer with God. Allow God to release the revelation that he's trying to release. Test all things and, and the spirit and the word shall agree. Hold fast to what's good and true. Get rid of this evil components. So I'm telling you, don't take man's word, not even mine. Go back. It says... Test all things. It doesn't say, take my word. It says, you, because you's not there, but it's implied. You test all things. Don't rely on everybody else to test it for you. You go and test all things. So go get in the word. Get in God's face. Have a conversation with him. Let him release this to you. I'm serious about that. I ain't saying this. Go and test it. And if you find somewhere I was wrong, come message me. Come message me. Because well, I need to be right too. I, I, I'm confident in the word that God gave me. Very confident. But I'm just, I, 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 that's how, how serious I am. About God's word and the truth in his word. And your elevation. Second piece is, so you've tested all things. Don't worry about what other people say about you in the assignment that they've called you to. That God's called you to. Be confident in what he's called you to. Be sure about what God's called you to. People will speak. People will talk. Paul didn't... The world's going to be the world, so stop worrying about how the world sees you, first of all. In the church, stop worrying about them too, because Paul had to continuously have conversation with some of these folks in church. That's what these letters, most of these letters are about. He's fixing an issue with, with folks out of order who can't get it together themselves, so he got to fix the problem. Alright? Y'all be blessed. Love you all. We're not creating rogue warriors. Don't be Korth, Datham, and Abara. God has kingdom order. God has kingdom direction. Reach out to him. Let him know what you're trying to do. Ask him when he releases. Because he even says to them in Malachi um, 3 and 10, um, even test me. So he wants you to test all all things. So you need to, if God gives you a word, you need to really delve into it and understand. He gives the end at the beginning because he gives the end at the beginning. That might not be the thing to move on. You need to ask him. You need to. See, you might need to sit on the ramparts a little bit longer and wait until he gives you the legs of the thing. But understand clearly what God has called for. And when he tells you to move, don't stop sitting there and just move. All right. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this word that you gave. We pray that it blesses the hearers of this word, that uh, some folks have been delivered and freed from their bondage, that the chains have come off, uh, that they are no longer in a slow-mo movie, that they are able to move as at the speed that you ask them to move, that they will no longer be uh, held back by weights, that they have been relinquished from them, that they are able to see your word clearly and differently, and they are able to move, to it, move in a different beat, a beat that is to you that beat that is according to the spirit the holy spirit lord we thank you for uh releasing the spirit unto this world so that we could receive it freely and we ask if we have not received it that it comes upon us uh, thank you lord for the holy spirit in me this is my prayer directly uh and that you have given me the ability and the power to do your will and to do your work and to be able to work um uh, uh efficiently lord i ask that everyone who has the Holy Spirit is able to recognize what they've actually received and the joy that you bring when the fruits of the Spirit come and reside in the rooms. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for that. Allow the fruits of the Spirit to go out. Allow your love to be in front of us, that we walk in love at all times, that we are able to walk in love so much that truth, uh, even if it hurts a little bit, is able to do the job that it's called to do. Lord, allow us to continue to be pleasing in your sight. Allow our worship to be uh, grateful, uh, 
great a great essence unto you, a great smell to you, that you smell the aroma, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, uh, that it be a pleasing aroma. Lord, we thank you, Lord, uh, for continue to see us, continue to work with us, continuing to uh, purify us. Lord, we know we have further to go, but we thank you uh, for being able to use us. Allow us to get closer to you. Uh, Lord, our heart's prayer is that you know our name, that you continue to know our name, so that as we get done, that we don't have to worry about uh, I you saying, I never knew you, but we hear these great words, well done, good and faithful servant. We are here to do your works and do your will. In your mighty matchless name, Jesus, thank you for this word. In your name, amen. You all be blessed. Love you all. Uh, I will see you next time.